Nobody's just waiting for one. It was so deflated. I felt so bad. She will. She might be true, but that's not the first thing. All right. Yep. Uh, go ahead and just mute the microphone for now. Sure.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, on our second and a half day of the conference. Um, I'm honored to be here to welcome the plenary speakers this morning. Uh, but before that, I thought I'd share a teeny bit about myself. My name is Anna Lavoy, and I am a faculty at H in, at CSU, the Department of Human Dimensions and Natural Resources, who is hosting this conference and pathways. And what brings me here today is I thought I'd share uh, previous work I did before joining CSU. I used to work at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center here in Seattle, and I was privileged to do a project uh, focused on women in Bristol Bay fisheries. And so I'm really proud of that work. And my work emphasizes the gendered roles in fisheries because we often think of men in fisheries, but we don't recognize um, the roles that women play. And in Alaska, um, from the project, you know, women play a major role in holding down the fort, contributing to family and community well being, and maintaining apartments in Alaska. So it's a great project. I won't go on and on. I am sharing that later today in a virtual presentation. But to quote um, what many of the women said, and very important part of this conference is the theme, and uh, salmon is life. And so we, we want to see a future with salmon, not without salmon. <laughs> so thank you. And um, our first um, plenary speaker today is, is Gretchen Green. And Dr. Green has over 25 years of experience in natural resource energy, agricultural, and community economics. Her work centers on bringing the value of environmental quality into economic decision making. Gretchen has extensive experience with ecosystem services valuation, natural resource damage assessments, commercial and recreational fisheries, decision making with uncertainty, demographics, equity and forecasting, and cost benefit analysis. Much of her work focuses on water management in a changing climate. She has worked with numerous federal, state, and municipal agencies, as well as private industrial clients, law firms helping each evaluate investment in the natural environment. She has worked for and with dozens of tribes and First Nations in North America, as well as other indigenous groups from Mongolia to Botswana. Among other work as a consultant, Gretchen now supports the Puget Sound Partnership, which is an organization that coordinates efforts to restore Puget Sound as the group is bringing more social science into their processes. In her free time, Gretchen teaches economics at Clark College in Vancouver, Washington, and helps her husband run a small sustainable farm raising cattle, sheep, and pigs, as well as produce and eggs. <laughs> That's quite quite um, a bio there. <laughs> so, um, with that, I welcome Gretchen to the stage. Okay, super. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Anna. Um, I'm so excited to be here. We've been talking about this for a couple of years now. And so thanks very much for having me. Thanks for inviting me, Mike. Um, I first want to uh, honor acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory and homeland of the Suquamish tribe, um, or the people of the clear salt waters, uh, who have lived here for thousands of years, and also acknowledge the rights of the many nations who have inhabited Puget Sound and uh, the Columbia River and have lifeways that respect and manage this, the salmon since time immemorial. Also, um, for those of you who are new to Washington State, I am happy to be the ambassador 
uh, the ambassador of uh, Washington State, where we are the proud, where our uh, newly just in, oh, thank you. Uh, just at the end of March, we newly determined that our state sport is pickleball. And it was invented just down the road at Bainbridge Island in 1965. And I have brought my pickleball rackets. It's a good ambassador. If anyone wants to um, learn more about it or play a game, it takes about five minutes to learn. And it's so fun. There's a player right there. Yes, I'm sure there's a court somewhere um, around, and I'll be here for a couple of days. So, um, with that, um, I'm, I'm here to talk about. Uh, how environmental economists think about salmon. And I think I'm trying to make the case today that, um, that environmental economists kind of have a, a unique role in environmental management. And maybe we're, we're kind of good at helping take all the pieces of the puzzle and put the puzzle together. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Well, we'll see if I make the case. Um, so first, first I'm gonna uh, talk about some different frameworks that economists use to think about salmon. So I've got markets here, total economic value, natural capital. And then um, if you're not paying attention too much, what I really want you to pay attention to is that segment called ecosystem management, I'll alert you. Because that's kind of <laughs> a framework that I really like. And, and, and I'm kind of, I'd love to see how this group um, responds to it. And then uh, some concluding remarks. Okay, markets. Um, we all know about markets. Last night I went to my friend's house and had the most delicious piece of wild Chinook salmon for dinner. So we know that in many places you could buy uh, fish in the markets and we have a lot of representation from commercial, uh, or some representation from the commercial fishermen. So one way economists think about uh, the fishery is think about the markets and what is the total value. So you see this column, uh, anyway, the, this is 2006 and 2007. This is at the national level, and those are in the, the second to last column is the thousands of dollars in 2017 in the value of X vessels. So right when it gets off the boat, um, salmon, all the different varieties, about 98% of that comes from Alaska. And then 2% comes from California, Oregon, and Washington. And so that's one kind of sense of value. But you think about this fishery, it's, um, it's, it's really big and it's a, sort of the center of an economic industry. So you have linkages that also create jobs and income. The salmon fishery itself does, but then it gets processed and it goes, uh, it's canned, it's frozen, and it gets to the market. And so all the way forward, there are linkages, and then backward, there are linkages um, in terms of the inputs that the fishermen buy to go out. The fleet is maintained, I think, mostly up here in Seattle. So all winter long, the, the fleet is there and the boats are being fixed up. So there's this whole swirl of economic activity that's associated with that industry. Um, and, and uh, this is a little statement on, we call that regional economic impacts. That's the ripple effect that happens. And growing up here in Washington, all young people um, know that if you really need to make money during the summers, you got to get up to Alaska and tap in somehow. You know, ideally it's great if you can get on a boat, that's where the big money is, but there's also money in, um, in being on a slime line. In the, in the canneries, you can do that. And, uh, and there's also the ripple effect. So there's bars and restaurants where you can work. So there's this whole you know, uh, economy that occurs that's generated from that salmon fishery. And to take it, everyone's talking about their own personal experiences. So I, I sort of, this uh, comes to mind that in uh, my summer after freshman year in college, I needed to make some money. And so a friend of a friend had a place in Ketchikan, Alaska. And that was quite an education, I will tell you. And we went up there and we waited and waited and, the, and there was nothing, and the runs hadn't started happening. We'd just sit and read at the cannery in hopes that we would get on at the cannery. And then boom, all the ships come in and the police is, you know, a bustle and, or the boats come in and everybody's humping and it's the middle of summer and the, 
the sun hardly ever goes down. You don't know if it's night or day. Quite an experience. So that's kind of my personal anchoring to that whole market concept. Okay, another um, framework that I want to talk about is uh, what we call total total economic value. So the, the commercial fishery is not everything that we need to be thinking on about when we're doing um, environmental management, right? So we break it down and try to put uh, the different types of value in different buckets to, to get to a total economic value. And this, this graph here, that, I mean, this, this, this set of buckets, it's not perfect and there's lots of overlap and it comes in different forms, but, but basically we think about um, use value and then non-use value. But within use value, there's the markets that's directly using the salmon, right? So there's uh, market-based use value. There's also, what about recreational use? So recreation, salmon fishing is also huge and recreational use value well, we don't exactly have a market for it. If you want, you can just go down to the dock and, and start fishing right now. So what? So economists like myself estimate a, a non-market value for the value of recreational fishing so that we can make some decisions and make sure that we don't lose the recreational fishing because every, a lot of people, have you met recreational fishermen? They're quite adamant about it. It's their lifeblood. Um, so, and then subsistence fishermen too. A lot of the, especially the, the lower income folks uh, get a lot of nutrition and get their food from the subsistence fishery. So all of that, but you don't, you pay a little bit for your equipment and go out there, but you don't technically have to pay for the privilege. It's a good that is managed in common, right? And so we estimate a non-market value. And there are many, elaborate statistical techniques to do this. I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with this. And for me, just taking this back to my own personal experience too, is that uh, my master's thesis, I went to University of Florida and I was involved in estimating the non-market value of, the, of recreational fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. And there was a huge survey we put, sent out to like 3,000 people, detailed questions. Um, John Loomis gave his talk yesterday on the Elwha Dams. He's an expert in this, teasing out the value. Um, and at that time, unfortunately, they were all on paper. So the new grad student, guess who got to input those into a database to earn her keep. So um, that's, that's my anchoring to that. And eventually I built one of these, you know, complex statistical models to estimate the value of recreational fishing. As an aside that was kind of interesting, at that very time in Florida, the recreational fishery was so important and the stocks were declining. And uh, the, and pe the people, there was a referendum to ban all commercial fishing in the state waters of Florida. And just, it, it, you know, like these referendums are, it's just people who like every place, when you went to the grocery store, there was always somebody standing there, please sign, and it passed. And the people banned, they were convinced that, that the commercial fishing in the state waters was what was causing the stock declines and, um, you know, depressing the value of the recreational fishing. So they got it passed by referendum and they banned all commercial fishing in state waters in Florida. And that was 25 years ago. Um, the jury is still out <laughs> as to whether that did anything for the stocks or not, but it's just kind of an evidence of kind of this policy and decision making, which was pretty interesting. And by the way, I just want to mention this, uh, this uh, total economic value, non-market value estimates, those are embraced by all the agencies. A lot of the work came out of the Corps of Engineers originally. Um, in total economic value, we also think about indirect use value. So this is where the habitat, like you can't just value the salmon. If you value the salmon, you have to value the habitat, right? So that's the indirect use of the large woody debris and, uh, and the banks and all of that. That has an indirect use value for salmon. Salmon itself has indirect use value for the orca, right? So that's just another category. And so some of the attributes like the water quality and temperature, those could also be um, thought of as indirect use value. And so we have lots of journal articles about the indirect use value too. And then the in super interesting one is the non-use or passive use value. 
which is the idea that the sort of stewardship idea, the idea that we care about the environment and we care about it being there and the system working well and being healthy, even if I'm never going to go fishing, right? That's the existence value. And then also in this passive or non-use value is um, the option. Well, I've never been fishing and I don't care about fish, but I might one day. So that's my option. Maybe I have value because I want to preserve because I might use it or the bequeath value, my my uh, my children or their children or, you know, my people in the future uh, may want to use it. So I think it's valuable for that. And then cultural value, all the cultural value and sustaining the traditions. You think about the tribes here, especially, but all the different cultures um, and uh, someone was talking about uh, the Bristol Bay fishery. Well, Anna, you were just talking about the culture of the of the fishery um, of, in Bristol Bay. And so there's there's all these cultural values that are there too, and we acknowledge those. And most of the agencies, the you know federal and state agencies, typically acknowledge that there are these passive use values. There's also you know spiritual and religious values, and um, I think there are economists who go there, but. I kind of draw the line at religious. Spiritual, I might be able to get there, but I don't, I don't spend any time trying to estimate uh, religious value, personally. Okay, so that's, uh, that's total economic value. Another concept is natural capital, and I think a lot of people in this room know a lot more about this than I do. And this is the idea that we have, you know, stocks and flows of, um, we have a stock of, a fishery, and then the flow is the reproduction, right? And this is just like we think of an investment portfolio. If you have savings, etc., you have a stock of capital, and you're hoping it's generating through time um, some kind of a flow of income. So this is the same concept here. We have a stock in the fishery, and we're we're trying to manage it so sustainably. So, and uh, somebody mentioned it yesterday. I think it was in. Mark's film, they were talking about managing the fisheries sustainably so that you're not dipping into the capital. And you know, if you dip into the capital in your in your investment fund, eventually you're going to run out of money and then you get no flow and you've eaten up all the capital. And um, so this, this these management styles, Eleanor Ostrom is somebody who's made that, uh, did a study of all the communal management systems. So you have to have a system in place with rules and everyone has to agree. And so these communal management systems are sort of aimed at managing the fishery um, sustainably. Um, restoration is another way that we are trying to uh, manage the fishery stocks now, especially in Washington, as we've seen them on the decline. And um, Anna mentioned that I, I work to support the Puget Sound Partnership, which is trying to restore Puget Sound so that we can have a healthy habitat and environment to get the, the stocks uh, back. But, uh, but also, as an economist, we think about incentives and, you know, the restoration has a little, uh, there's a little funny incentive there. It's almost like Eisenhower and the military industrial complex, like restoration sort of gets a lot of money and it takes on a life of its own. And the biologists sometimes say, you know, in some of these um, river basins, you can find more uh, fishery uh, biologists than you can find re returning spawners, right? Because it has a tendency to generate its own world. And so that's something as an economist, we kind of pay attention to. And then the other thing about the natural capital is that, you know, who owns that stock? In my portfolio, if I dip into the stock and deplete it, I'm really pissed off and I pay the price for that. Problem is the fishery management um, when we don't really even know how many there are and we're doing the best to manage it, but who pays the price for that loss? We all do, but the managers don't necessarily. And I wanted to say, Let's see. Oh, uh, well, there's the, so most of the job of this is, is passed uh, to the, the eight fishery management councils throughout, um, throughout the country. And there's some smaller ones too, but the main ones that deal with salmon are the Pacific Fishery Management Council for Washington, Oregon and, and California and Idaho, and then the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. So those are bunches of stakeholders. They come up with a fishery management plan, commercial and recreational stocks, 
And, you know, again, tremendous amount, I'm sure plenty of people in this room are involved in these kinds of things, but to the extent that thinking about the personal experience a couple of days ago, I went to visit the Bonneville Dam and um, the, I had some friends in town and I went up to the visitor center and one of the first things she said was, we had 4,216 Chinook pass through here yesterday. You know, people are counting and keeping as best track as they can. So it's a big part of this. Anyway, so just to review quickly before I move on to the interesting part, there's this markets, and I anchor that with my summer and catch again. <laughs> there's this notion of total economic value, which is all includes all the non-market value and the non-use value, and I anchor that mentally with uh, my master's thesis, and then the natural capital and the sustainable fishery, which uh, we're doing a lot of work, and Kelly's going to be talking a lot about the Puget Sound Partnership, which is involved in that restoration piece of the, um, the natural capital. Okay, so ecosystem management, this is um, something that I do kind of really want to see if it resonates. It's always resonated with me, this particular graphic, and it's from a book from 2005, uh, that was produced by the natural research the national research council called valuing ecosystem services and i really like the way you kind of start at the top the ecosystem has structure and function so it's all the components of the natural system and those components have ecological processes that produce uh, the ecosystem goods and services which is the benefits of the natural environment that we all enjoy now, uh, this is where the environmental economist comes in, helping sort of tally up and look at and think about the ecosystem goods and services. And then, um, and then we help think about what is the economic value function? And it's all about the values, right? But just understanding them can be challenging, but it is, uh, I was talking with Irene yesterday and she said it just really all comes down to values. And that's part of why this conference is really great because we all need to be working together. We all have different values, but um, different people, different groups have different values. So there's this economic value function. And then that value system, all those values tumble together and that produces the human actions, all of our management decisions. And then, yes, but we've learned all too well, a little bit too late, how those actions then in turn affect the ecosystem structure and function. So I really like that framework or a simple framework. Love to hear some feedback on that. Um, it's not mine, but I'm kind of trying to promote it a little bit because I find it's helpful. It's helpful to me because as I said earlier, we work in sort of putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and it's such a huge puzzle, you know, 50,000 pieces to this puzzle. And most of us researchers kind of work on one little piece. But putting it all together is um, important too. And so I tried to take this framework uh, just yesterday and was trying to put it a little bit, sketch out an example of how this might work for salmon. So for example, uh, the, you know, the ecosystem structure and function that involves the water quality, the spawning habitat, the, the populations themselves, and the other species like the marine mammals, um, the sediment quality, and then the, the function the ecological function that produces uh, the goods and services has to do with, you know, the number of returning spawners and what's the food web like and the hydrologic flows and don't forget climate change. So all of those are the ecological components that, that influence the quantities and the quality of the services that we benefit from, the food, the recreation, the orcas benefit from, the orca prey, the traditions that we're maintaining for our cultural traditions and you know the education. Uh, you can't go to school, uh, you can't be a youngster around here without going to a hatchery and learning about the, you know, the, the, the journey of the salmon out to the sea and coming back is such a beautiful story. Um, so there's all those, those are sort of the ecosystem goods and services, examples of them. And then the value function, when you think about the markets, we talked about that. Um, access to the coastline and to the uh, to the fisheries is is a factor. All the demographics play a role, as I described. We all have different values for this fishery for different reasons, 
and all of our choices and preferences. So that's where um, the economists come in and help us think about that. And then, um, and those values include, so the, the bottom circle is the values, the cultural value, the jobs, the intrinsic value, the education value, and all of those, all of that, you know, uh, environmental activism, for example, all of that influences the decisions we make uh, that in turn will go back and affect the structure and function of the ecosystem. That's a picture of the Elwha Dam uh, that is no longer there, I think, on the left. And then the picture down on the right is the, the tribes fishing at Salilo Falls uh, back in the day before the dams uh, went in uh, along the Columbia River. So, how am I doing for time? Do I have a little time left? Uh, I'm not, I'm close? Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm kind of done. I just wanted to, <laughs> but, but I might blab on a little bit more or less depending on here. So, I just, the bottom line is that, okay, the stocks are in decline. That's pretty serious business. So we all need to be thinking about um, um, fisheries management. But the economics is all about balancing those trade-offs. Really, if you've studied it, or even if you remember your Econ 101, it's not about money. It's really about the choices you're making, the trade-offs. So that's where we live and breathe. And while, like my master's thesis, we can estimate monetary value for some of this, it's not really what we're all about. We're all about choices and making decisions and prioritizing this compared to that. Um, and looking at the incentives and the tools, I just want to um, talk about a, a couple of these tools uh, because benefit cost analysis is really a fabulous tool. And I think it has a bad name, or maybe some of you here think it's sort of a bad thing, they're turning everything to money and turning the crank. And um, the, the truth of the matter is, and for, for one case I was working, I had the privilege of reading like 13 the introductory chapter to 13 benefit cost analysis textbooks. And I can guarantee you every single one of them explains at the beginning that the beauty of benefit cost analysis is not getting an answer or getting a number at the end. The beauty is having a formal way to think through what are all the benefits and what are all the costs and who is bearing those benefits and who is bearing the cost. And what are the relative magnitude of the benefits and costs with this choice and that choice? And don't forget about taking it through time. It's not just the benefits and costs now, it's the benefits and costs through time. So a lot of this work, again, occurs now in terms of environmental management decisions. And we don't have to worry about money. We're working in terms of prioritization and relative value. Also, just as another example, Habitat equivalency analysis is what we do in uh, natural resource damage assessments. So when there's an oil spill or a contaminant of some kind, the formal process, because it's so difficult to understand what did the public lose when Deepwater Horizon happened. Uh, so the way, we, the way we make the public whole is by analyzing uh, the habitat, the years of habitat services that were lost, and then the responsible parties are obligated to restore the habitat in those units. And so the money isn't really part of it, but the economists are working closely with their friends, the ecologists, the biologists, and some of the decision makers. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that and let Kelly have some words. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's do questions after both the presentations, and we'll have both the presenters come up here. So, uh, if you have questions, please write those down on the cards and the tables, and then we'll collect those.
Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, our next presenter is Dr. Kelly Biedenweg. Dr. Biedenweg is, is an associate professor of human dimensions at Oregon State University's Fisheries and Wildlife Department. Her research interests are in human well being, social values, and decision making and natural resource management. She has spent the last 10 years focused primarily in the Puget Sound, in the 10 years before in Latin America, often collaborating with the Nature Conservancy, the US Forest Services Pacific Northwest Research Station, the Puget Sound Partnership, and King County, among others. She received a EPA Early Career Award for her research on integrating human well being and ecosystem services in the Puget Sound, and as a former NSF Seas, NSF IGERT, um, so American Association of University of Women and University of Florida, Florida Alumni Fellow. She has a PhD from the University of Florida in the Human Dimensions of Natural Resource Management with, with certificates in Environmental Education and Communication and Latin American Studies, and a concentration in Tropical Conservation and Development. She also holds a master's degree in conservation biology and a bachelor of science in marine ecology. Um, please welcome Dr. Kelly Bino. All right, I'm short, so good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, good. Just, you know, getting a little life, a life blood here. Um, first, I want to thank um, the leaders who have been on this same stage with us over the last couple of years, or a couple of days, and millennia, um, sharing their deep connections to this place and to Sam specifically. Um, I really am honored to be sharing the same stage and, and honestly, it's very humbling to be invited to be here. Um, I actually have chosen to script out my talk, which is new for me, um, but I feel like if I don't, I could go in lots of really exciting directions, but maybe not the direction you wanted to go. Um, so Gretchen really set this up for me. This is not the scripted part, but Gretchen really set this up for me. Um, I am not an economist. So I actually come from this from psychology, um, as do a lot of human dimensions folks. But what I'm going to do today is give you a case study of exactly how we have implemented the concept of different types of values using a completely different language, completely different jargon than what Gretchen just used. And so this is actually a really great um, experience for us to, as social scientists, even learn how to integrate our own languages across each other, right? Um, so I don't share the multiple generations of connection to this place we call the Puget Sound, as do some of the speakers prior. My first homecoming here was when I was 17, which I will admit is 30 years ago. Moving into the dorms at Western Washington University to study marine biology. Western Washington is in Belling and Washington, for those who don't know, um, right near the border of Canada. 
but this place immediately captured my heart and my soul. To the extent that even though I ventured off to faraway places for my formal um, graduate education, I returned while writing my PhD to live about six miles south of, as a crow flies from here on the north end of Ashon Island. While living on Ashon Island, I began a 10-year project in collaboration with the Puget Sound Partnership, which you heard Gretchen mention, and I'm going to give a little more background on, funded by the National Science Foundation and the Environmental Protection Agency, to see how we could integrate human well-being into a Puget Sound restoration, monitoring, planning, and evaluation. Now, human well-being is the term that I use as a psychologist to take into consideration values, right? So that's kind of that translation there. So I continue to be an active member of the Puget Sound Restoration Community, even though I'm Oregon State. Some people are like, why are you Oregon State and you work in Puget Sound? Um, that's just how academia life works, right? <laughs> as many of us know. Um, I'm an elected member to the Puget Sound uh, Science, the Puget Sound Partnership Science Panel. And I am the PI to the science money that comes from the EPA to the NEP, the National Estuarine Program, that is specifically for social science. So the other caveat is that my work is not specific to salmon. But as we've discussed, the entire ecosystem must be healthy to restore and protect all the things that we care about. And maybe unfortunately, not all humans who live in this region have an explicit connection to salmon. But my hope is that because everyone has some connection to some point of the ecosystem, we can work with them towards the holistic restoration that will benefit many of the things we care about, including salmon. I haven't met anyone who isn't moved by hearing the stories of our elders on this land or the phenomenal filmmaking and media that have focused our attention on the decline of the Puget Sound due to what we tend to call the thousand cuts. But I have consistently heard from many natural resource scientists and managers that they don't know how to fit these ideas into existing planning frameworks. The reality is that we work in the environmental governance system of restoration based on Western science and its reductionism. As can be seen in the, in the image here with the Puget Sound vital signs and the indicators that we choose to drive our environmental planning and monitor our success. And with the exception of economics and social sciences, the rest of us, um, or not many of us, in humanities and social scientific approaches that tell stories and elicit emotion don't really have a place within this paradigm for adding in our information. Okay, so I'm gonna take a little step. I tend to have two pedestals that I jump between in my professional life. And in my personal life, I have a whole lot of pedestals. You can ask my husband. Um, but my one of my pedestals is the importance of listening. And the other is the importance of integrating social science into restoration and conservation. And it actually just clicked last night in a conversation, so thank you, Christine, <laughs> that social science really is a tool for integrating non-judgmental listening into conservation. So learning how to listen and doing it effectively is the most critical aspect of environmental restoration in our social ecological systems. As we've said throughout this conference, we know a whole lot about the ecological science. Now it's about working together to get it done. And to do so, we absolutely have to listen. Listening is the biggest skill that I teach to undergraduate students. So you can um, thank me, the next generation is going to have this skill. Right? <laughs> and we have hundreds of uh, people coming through our, our program, which you may or may not know. In my communications um, for Fish and Wildlife Professionals class, I teach them, um, or I make them find a topic that is the opposite of what they believe about in hunting or fishing or something in conservation. And they have to listen to it, listen to it either through a podcast or through reading it for a minimum of an hour. And then they have to non judgmentally write what that person was trying to get across. Every single student, thousands now, has said that this was almost an impossible project and they would never have done it if they weren't being agreed. <laughs> they all wanted to stop immediately. But with the skills that I provide them, and that they weren't that many skills that I had to provide, but with the minimum skills and guidance that I gave them, and with the fortitude to do it because of a grade, they all say that it is the most important activity they do in that entire class. And some have even said it's the most important activity they've done in their, in their undergraduate career. So we can't really listen 
to 4 million people who live in the Puget Sound in the way that we can, in the conventional sense, listen. But in essence, I do think that's what integrating social science does. It does the listening through data collection, though sometimes crudely, and asks us to take into consideration this data in our planning dialogue. So today I'm gonna to talk, to talk to you about the development of quantified human well-being indicators for the Puget Sound region to monitor and encourage restoration of all our ecosystem components, including salmon, in a way that considers the rights, needs, and interests of our diverse human populations. This process has been at an ecosystem level from the white tops to the white caps, as we say here, and not specific to salmon again, I'm gonna say that a couple of times just so that we know that, but I will point out the implications for salmon throughout. Our goals in doing this work are to bring humans back into the ecosystem recovery conversation using the language of the dominant management paradigm. By identifying and monitoring the diverse connections Puget Sound residents derive from the non-human environment, we believe we can create more effective, more equitable, and more motivating policies and strategies for restoration. So I can tear that slide, we're done with it. Um, so before I go any further, I want to acknowledge the deep collaboration of this work. None of it could have been done without our team of researchers and policy partners. And this part is critical, policy partners. I actually will not work in a region that I don't have a champion within the agency who's going to implement the work. It's just not worth it. And these women over here on the right are, have just been phenomenal. They've taken the work and they have fought for it. Um, you see they've all moved on because they got a little tired. Um, <laughs> But they did, uh, they, they are the ones who made it, made it go as far as it did. Um, so they engaged in the research and the advocacy and the monitoring and the communicating of the importance of human well-being and ecosystem restoration. So as I said, I'm going to quickly walk us through the result of a 10-year process and maybe demystify a bit how this has worked. First, I'm going to briefly cover the background geography of policy supporting human well-being integration. Then I'm going to describe the theoretical framework we laid to demonstrate its importance. And then I'll describe <clears throat> or walk us through the applied process of indicator development and monitoring, finishing with two examples of how conceptually we've succeeded in applying human well being to affect re um, ecosystem restoration decisions here in the region. So, first, uh, what makes Puget Sound unique? So, you, you know, we're all sitting in the Puget Sound. Um, I think you've heard already that it's homeland to 28 tribes and 4 million people in 11 counties, and it is growing exponentially. It's part of EPA's National Estuarine Program, and it's considered the largest estuary in the continental U.S. by water volume. Within the NEP program, we all are the largest something, and we have to figure out how. <laughs> so you might be the largest by like miles of shoreline or whatever, so ours, ours is the largest um, by water volume, we swear. So um, the NEP or the EPA's NEP program requires um, each program to have a management conference. This is a bit of antiquated. We're working on revising this, but our management conference is led by the Puget Sound Partnership, which is what you've heard about. Puget Sound Partnership is a standalone state agency that was created in the early 2000s, <clears throat> and it's more it's more of what many of you probably have heard of as a backbone agency that is tasked with coordinating the recovery of Puget Sound with collaboration with all of these listed entities that you see on the outside ring <clears throat> and um, the different programs within the circle. So when um, the partnership was created, it was created with these six goals here. And our effort to develop human well-being indicators was both supported by and inspired by the goals in state statute that created the partnership. This is also a really critical point. It helps so much to have regulation to leverage and help us fight um, for social science integration. When it's not in when it's not in statute, it's really hard to continue justifying. So these six goals that are in statute are also on the outer ring of the vital sign image you see here. The vital signs are our metrics for monitoring whether we're reaching our statutory goals. You'll notice that the first two goals are actually human centered. Yet, when we started this work, the vital sign reel did not have metrics for humans, although there were placeholders for a few on the left. 
There were plenty of important ecological indicators that had been developed by small expert groups over several years, but the human ones hadn't been developed because there wasn't the capacity. There was also an assumption that addressing water quality, quantity, and species and habitats would automatically contribute to human well-being. And because there was also an assumption that we couldn't possibly identify regionally relevant human well-being metrics. As a social scientist, I said, well, that sounds like a hypothesis to test. <laughs> So <clears throat> we first developed a couple of conceptual models that are specific to the region. The image on the right um, builds right off of what Gretchen just shared with you. And so hopefully you see the parallels here. Um, it's a social ecological system model developed by our partners specifically for the Puget Sound Partnership called the Puget Sound Integrated Ecosystem Conceptual Model. It helped us get across the, the basic importance of human well-being and ecosystem restoration, because we were really only paying attention to how bad humans were to the biophysical condition and not really looking at it as a system. You'll notice we relied on ecosystem services framing, which basically says that humans benefit from and depend upon the biophysical condition, and at the same time influence it throughout our, <clears throat> through our individual activities and our management responses. It's a two-way system, but as I said, we had only been focused in one direction. The image on the left basically builds out that human well-being circle in the social ecological systems model to demonstrate the many components of well-being that we could and should be considering. Just like the ecological indicators had done, it built upon a Western scientific um, categorization of values, including psychological well-being, physical well-being, economic well-being, good governance, cultural well-being, etc. But just because we had a broader definition of well-being didn't mean we actually had regionally relevant indicators. So <clears throat> to give an example more specific to this conference, I'm going to briefly share how Sophia Emerson, a graduate student, worked with myself and Justine James from the Quinault Indian Nation, which is on the outer coast of the Olympic Peninsula, to explore what human well-being dimensions she could identify from interviews with elders around the importance of blueback salmon for their well-being. So when she did these interviews and she applied our, our framework for well-being, she identified concepts such as community events, um, identity, fairness of fishing practices and fishing um, allocation, economic activities, and many other contributions to human well-being from the salmon's health. And she also suggested ways that those dimensions could be monitored quantitatively over time. We then held a community meeting with a salmon dinner have to have a salmon dinner and used clickers, which um, everyone loves clickers, except students, they hate it now, um, <clears throat> to ask Quinault tribal members to rate the current status of these domains on a Likert style scale. This led to the length of the bars and the averages you see here. The idea was to have numeric data that could potentially link better to the existing quantitative data being used by the tribal fishery scientists in determining how and where to best allocate resources for blueback restoration, or to monitor the effectiveness of doing so. These data, well, actually, before I go there, these data were actually never applied, though, in that context, possibly because it wasn't the right approach for the context in the end, but definitely because I moved to Oregon and uh, right after this work, and we didn't have a long-term engagement agreement, as I was able to do with the Puget Sound Partnership. So I want to acknowledge before I walk into the Puget Sound process, walk back, go back to the Puget Sound process, that the Quinault Indian Nation work and the Puget Sound work were inspired by a Swinomish project. Uh, Swinomish is another tribal nation here in the Puget Sound to identify indigenous health um, indicators a few years before. We did our best to integrate these ideas, although our audience was not um, entirely indigenous as it included all residents of Puget Sound, both native and non-native. So to develop the Puget Sound indicators, we selected three very different sub-basins. Whatcom County, if any of you are familiar with, is a bit more agricultural oriented. Puyallup, which is more urban, that's where Tacoma is based. And the Hood Canal, Hood Canal uh, right next to us here, which is a uh, very pristine for fjord. We ran a series of workshops with diverse stakeholders and rights holders to identify how the Puget Sound ecosystem contributed to the well-being of the diverse populations in these regions. These included a series of conversations, rankings, and modifications of proposed indicators. 
And the Venn diagram shows where common themes occurred across the three regions. It was at this overlap that we felt we could generalize to the region and recommend adopting indicators. This all sounds really fast in 30 seconds. This was um, a minute, it was two years of work. So we took these recommended indicators um, to both local and uh, national social scientists and local policymakers and asked them to rank them using different criteria that were relevant to their sources of knowledge. So conceptual validity and measurability for the social scientists and relevance to management concerns and communication power for the policymakers. So this combination of community-based collection and ranking and rating and information from social scientists and policymakers resulted in the indicators you now see um, here outlined from the vital sign wheel. And that what, I, what happens is we take these recommended indicators to <clears throat> the leadership council of the Puget Sound Partnership, which is a governor appointed committee that makes executive decisions regarding Puget Sound recovery. And it was through the leadership council that these human well-being indicators were adopted in 2015 for permanent monitoring with dedicated state funding over two years. So what do we do with dedicated state funding? In our case, um, it's a general public survey. And when I say dedicated state funding, 200,000 a year, or every two years, sorry. So it's not that much money, right? Nothing compared to what we're doing for um, restoration projects for salmon and all. Um, but what we're doing um, is that for seven of the vital signs, not including economic vitality, drinking water, and air quality, which all have existing data that we use for reporting, we use a modified Dillman design to sample 9,000 randomly selected households. In the two iterations that we have done this, we've had about a 30% response rate, which we're pretty happy with, considering that this is a general public survey. So to measure the vital signs, we use questions that vary from frequency of engagement in activities or experiences to Likert style responses about satisfactions with opportunities. So these are basically 3,000 30% of 9,000, 3,000 self-reports of human well-being associated with the region environment. We do this self-report approach because not all cultural groups will have the same practices associated with local foods or cultural events, for example. So instead of counting participation in specific events, we instead focus on the perceived impact of those events on our population. This is where my psychology brain comes in, right? Salmon come into these monitoring priorities in a few ways, directly, Local foods indicator includes subsistence collecting of fish. The economic vitality indicator includes outdoor work and natural resource industries. And the outdoor recreation measures participation in fishing as one of 13 activities. Indirectly, we know that access to salmon for many cultural groups contributes to all of the indicators. One's opinion of environmental governance, one's sense of place, one's satisfaction with cultural opportunities, and one's psychological well-being. We then report these data in maps and graphs, because we like maps and graphs. And because we collect lots of demographic data, we can run regression models to see if any of these metrics differ significantly across social groups. We are also able to overlay these data, these social data, with trend data in our biophysical metrics to test questions about water quality, health, habitats, and species, and components of human well-being. As a state-funded survey, these data are publicly available, so anyone here, research agency, can access them. You can use it for, for planning, you can use it for research, you can use it for communication purposes, reach out to the partnership, reach out to me. Um, in terms of racial and ethnic representation, the responses to this public survey have actually reflected the Puget Sound population, but one of the things you probably know is we are very white, right? <laughs> So over the past three years, what we have been doing just to make sure that we are hitting uh, the most vulnerable communities, um, we are targeted community-based outreach um, projects with racial and ethnic minorities to explore if there would be more important indicators for these communities and test the actual responses to the survey against those who choose to complete the public survey. We've now done this with Latinx communities through advertising on Latinx media, offering the survey in Spanish, sharing on Latinx social media sites, and participating in Latino outdoors activities. With elder African Americans in a community home, which I hear was a really amazing, phenomenal experience. I was not the one that collected that data. And with different Asian American groups at Civic Center. 
So far, we are finding that the categories for the well-being indicators are appropriate for all of these racial and ethnic groups, um, and that the responses in these targeted audiences don't differ in any way from those who choose to respond to the randomized survey. We also get to watch people fill out the survey, and they love it. They love its color, and they love the fact they get a $2 bill. $2 bill like, really sells it. Why not do a $2 bill? So throughout this time, we've also been setting the stage for these data to actually inform restoration planning. Although there is use for the data for monitoring purposes and potentially for mo uh, modeling purposes, I personally believe that just the act of conceptualizing the categories has been the most effective for restoration planning. So I'm going to provide two examples. This here is an example of working with the Hood Canal <clears throat> Coordinating Council to develop their shellfish initiative a couple of years ago. Don't worry, I'm going to walk you through this and I don't expect you to read anything on the right. Nobody has superpowers like that. So um, this isn't a salmon example, but it certainly could be. It's just that shellfish are the most important for Hood Canal. So how many of you in the room are familiar with uh, structured decision making concept of it? Okay, that's what I thought. So there's, there's quite a few, um, but not everyone. It starts by bringing together a diverse group of rights holders and stakeholders. And in the case of Hood Canal, this included tribal representatives, shelters restoration scientists, both in nonprofit and state institutions, small scale and commercial shellfish growers, and conservationists, among others. We met once a month over 18 months for a couple of hours via Zoom because this was during COVID. But they stuck with it. We had this, we had 20 people engaging in this process the whole time. I was super impressed. And we worked through a process of identifying our shared values, then identifying the threats to those values and the most likely actions that could reduce those threats. It was at the shared value stage that we identified human components of restoration, here translated as objectives. You'll see the objectives four, five, and six are, are human specific. And like I said, I don't anticipate you being able to read the image on the right, but what it is, is the final calculation of the likelihood that each proposed objective um, each proposed strategy, the words on the left, on the y-axis, would be impacted, <clears throat> would impact our shared objectives, which are the colored bars, one color for each objective. So essentially, this is looking at multiple benefits of strategies across our shared objectives. And it ended up with us finding and identifying 10 prioritized strategies that had multiple benefits for both humans and shellfish, and drove the funding of two projects that have recently been completed. At the basin scale, the past year was the first year that we feel really confident that we influenced region-wide planning. So this is, I say 10 years, and, and I guess I keep forgetting it's, we're in 2022, so it's been more than 10 years now. Um, every four years, the Puget Sound Partnership creates an action agenda, which is to guide all restoration funding and strategies in the region. This action agenda is, is critical. The, the um, state and county and um, tribal governments pick it up. Um, appropriations, funding appropriations are based on this action agenda, so it's a, it's a really critical document. The first draft of the action agenda focused only on three objectives, protecting and restoring habitat, protecting and improving water quality, and protecting the food web. When my team of social scientists and partners looked at this draft, which was just last year, 2021, we noticed it had no attention to the human components not in specific objectives or in potential strategies within the three objectives they identified. We didn't see good governance. We didn't see cultural practices. We didn't see economic vitality, even though these are part of our monitoring program. So instead, there were the three ecological categories for which it was assumed that upon their improvement, there would automatically be trickle-down benefits to broad human benefits. Our team disagrees with the idea of trickle-down benefits because we found that to be a pretty inaccurate assumption in the past. So our partners figuratively stood up, because we're in COVID, and said, wait, we have frameworks and data to make human well-being more prominent and equitable in this space. Let's show you how. And we drafted the objectives that you now see here in <clears throat> objective number five, ensuring human well-being. It's been adopted by the Leadership Council in the same process I told you before, and is currently informing planning at county, city, and state scales through 2026. As these entities plan their restoration projects, they will take into consideration the habitat and species benefits, but also the extent to which each of their approaches considers procedural justice, 
equitable distribution benefits, and a greater likelihood of engaging more Puget Sound residents in this beautiful ecosystem. So I've walked you through a pretty unique context of incorporating diverse dimensions of human well-being into the monitoring and planning for ecosystem recovery. It is admittedly an imperfect approach. I personally have a tally of all the defects in my head up here if you would like to ask me about them. Um, it's a particularly crude approach to listening to one each other, to each other. But it is more listening and prompting to listen than we've ever had before. And we will rely on adaptive management to determine whether these indicators or vital signs need to be modified to better listen to each other, whether the integration of human needs is any better for the ecosystem than a singular focus on the resource of concern, or whether our entire reductionist approach to ecosystem management needs to be completely dismantled for a new one that more effectively supports collaborative listening. So with that, I will end my story and thank all of our partners and funders over this time. And I will welcome any questions. Oh, I stopped sharing. I didn't mean to stop sharing, sorry. Is that what you wanted me to do or not? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So if folks have questions, uh, written those down or could write those down on the note cards and we'll come around and pick those up. Um, I wanted to thank um, Dr. Green and Dr. Bidaway for their wonderful presentations. Um, and we will be receiving questions, as I'll just mention. Thank you. Or just need to come up and answer. There are questions. <laughs> yes, both of you can come up here, please. Okay, so here's a question for Kelly. Can you speak to how the climate change considerations, also newly prominent in the AA, can affect and be affected by the well being goal strategies actions? Great, so somebody knows this process. So um, the other thing that was not in there, the reason why the well-being is five is because there was also a fourth added, which was climate change. Um, and that was the other, another group of folks who were like, hold on, why is climate change not um, explicitly in here? So, um, you know, this is still a conversation we're having, but one of the things about climate change is it is disproportionately affecting different user groups. Um, and so we actually see a really great integration of both the consideration of climate change and the consideration of human well-being because it helps us address um, the disproportionate impact on vulnerable communities. Um, I think that it, it still depends. On, uh, in the end, we're just going to have to watch how people take this. This is really guidance. Um, things will be evaluated and assessed on the extent to which they incorporate these objectives and the suggested strategies. But we won't know until people start implementing and integrating the effect to which it really does what we hope it will do. But we're hoping that any strategy will think about the biophysical component the future climate impacts and the equitable distribution of all of that. Hopefully that answers. Thank you. And by the way, I forgot to mention my name. I'm Paul White, and I'm one of the conference organizers from Colorado State University. Okay, so this is a question from the chat. Are there decision tools that state fish and wildlife agencies can use to set economic discount rates, especially quantitative or qualitative ways to set appropriate time horizons for setting discounts? <laughs> a resounding yes, thank you for asking, but um, <clears throat> one of the things that, that we like to work on is uh, decision tools to handle uncertainty. So it's so one of the big sources of uncertainty is how do you trade off the future for the present, which is the discount rate, 
And, um, and then there's all a host of other uncertainties, such as those associated with climate change and uh, the frequency of the storms. We were, I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday. But um, <clears throat> basically, what we, what we like to use, uh, what I like to use, are like dashboards, user-friendly dashboards, where you can just look at how your results uh, how your results are going to change depending on click, 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 use zero discount rate, use a 5%, use a 3%. And the real question is what, where does the discount rate have to go um, in order for my decision to change? So it's all focused on decisioning. Can you, there was one other thing they mentioned besides the discount rate. <clears throat> Oh, oh, and uh, quantitative and qualitative too. So that was the, the trigger I wanted, which was that, um, <clears throat> so for example, I mentioned habitat equivalency analysis, which boils everything down into service acre years. It's not, it's not monetary, but if you want to throw in a monetary value, uh, you know, that's another button on your dashboard because uh, service acre years in different communities can be, you know, $500 a service acre year up to you know $500,000 a service acre year in some of the natural resource damage uh, litigation or $100,000. Uh, so so the, you know there's a button for that too and the same thing for the qualitative there's a lot of tools that have uh, you can weight different attributes weight and score them and see how your decision changes so I'll leave it with that. Okay, here's a question for Kelly. Often something like recovery requires change, which can cause conflict. Do HWB metrics help manage the possibility that conflict gets perceived as reasons not to pursue a change? Yeah. yeah. Um, and this was from here in the room, so if, if it still doesn't make sense, we might have that person rephrase it. Often something like recovery requires change, which can cause conflict. Do HWB metrics can help manage the possibility that conflict gets perceived as a reason not to pursue change? Do you have a person? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, what I'm thinking about is that often the time there's conflict, right? Or Yeah, so I'll just be really cautious with the term of objectivity um, in the sense that I, my goal isn't necessarily objectivity, though I can see why many people would want that. My goal is transparency. Um, so we're making those decisions anyway, period, right? Whether we have the data and or even like the words in front of us, we're making the decisions. And this at least gives us a recognition that everybody is valuing these things. And um, you're right, conflict often comes from any loss of, of the things that we value, right? So everybody at some point is losing something. I personally am not, I don't believe in win-win. <laughs> I believe in loss and less loss um, in some of these. And so I think it gives us language and it gives us um, the opportunity to, to talk about, well, who's, with this data, we can see who's already maybe more um, vulnerable or more um, reliant on the things that we're talking about. Is that helpful? Okay, uh, we've got time for one or two more here, so I've, I've still got three or four in my hand here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, Gretchen, it appears that our patterns of urban suburban development are being inclusive of the whole economic picture. In other words, de <clears throat> developers and local electeds are making decisions in the absence of the environmental aspects. What changes in policy and practice would you advise are necessary to ensure no net loss function when developing within watersheds? Uh, I really appreciate that question because it, it, it gets at that model that I'm, I'm interested, you know, kind of 
getting the uh, the values that inform our decisions that that are then again going to affect the components of the environment. So I think that more and more uh, the, the no net loss phrase. I'm not sure who asked that, but that's that's a uh, having that's that's a regulatory phrase that we're just starting to use in Washington with respect to the um, to, to development. And I think that's an excellent approach. And that uh, so so I think I think it's happening more and more. But basically, we need to be sure that we incorporate the ecosystem services and all those values, which, as I said, all the all the agencies have embraced these. So there's, uh, you know, talk to me if you want to know where there's some some regulatory requirement. I mean, the the Department of Ecology conducts benefit cost analysis, and they're mandated to include all of these values. The Corps of Engineers. There's a lot of development that needs to include the ecosystem services service values. So I uh, so there, it, it's more a question of enforcing it. And actually doing it, I think, uh, but there's plenty of capability to look at ecosystem service values and uh, bring them into the decision making. Just as an example, I don't know where this one is, but I know I reviewed the benefit cost analysis for putting a dam in the Shahela Basin, and then they went back and put some ecosystem service values, and I didn't follow it up. But looking at the first one, I was like, this is completely going to change your decision making. Um, not to say that that dam won't come on the Chehalis, I'm afraid it, it may be on heading in that direction, but uh, but certainly incorporating the ecosystem service values can change your whole perspective. So to change what the actions are. Thank you. And now we have a question for Kelly. For the Hood Canal project, where you identified priorities, did any of the results of the analysis surprise you or the planners? I wonder because sometimes there are assumptions about values and preferences. That's a really, really great question. Um, yes, I think some things surprise. Yes, things surprise us. And um, what I, I don't know how many of you have actually done structured decision making, but one of the things that's turning out to be pretty common is that the, in the end, we often go back a couple steps because nobody's happy with the final step because they don't, they feel like their value got, somebody in the room feels like their value got washed away in the multi-benefit calculation. So what happened in that case was there were the six um, objectives and you know when the top 10 strategies, um, one of them or the top, the top 10 strategies did not incorporate the best strategies for economic vitality. And so we went back a step and took the top two best strategies for each of the six objectives because the economists in the room said, or the, the commercial shellfishers in the room said, we're not engaging in this unless you don't have our top two strategies. But that's the point of starship decision making, right? Is that we're having the conversation and we're recognizing the values and we can get to the point where we have a conversation around the optimal one for all of our values. And then we can see what the power dynamic is in the room and work towards the power dynamic. Um, I, that may, I don't know if that answers the question about surprise, but that was definitely the biggest take home for, for us. <laughs> we have time for one more quick one. Uh, question is, the collaborative decision-making process takes time, so how can it be used to address urgent issues occurring over shorter time scales, like dramatic deadlines, declines in fish populations occurring now? So my thing about time is um, time is about prioritization in the end, right? Like you're going to spend the time one way or another, either in conflict and adjudication or in planning. So make a choice. Um, I guess that's 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 my experience. Is we can put the time in now to make sure that after the fact of implementing whatever strategy we have implemented is going to be accepted and it's going to be based on the best science, or we can just run full stream ahead with one person's ideas and then be sued for the next ten years on it. Um, so I guess in the end, it's prioritizing it and checking the reality we're in. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking our presenters. Thanks to both. Um, we will now have a 30-minute coffee break, followed by concurrent sessions beginning at 1045.
Thank you.